Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. So thank you so much for being here and welcome to a conversation focused on the future of fiscally sponsored artists and projects in New York City. My name is Alejandra Lucas y Fuentes and I am the programs manager at Dance NYC and I will be your MC tonight along with Risa Shoup, executive director for Spaceworks. Um, I am about five feet tall, I'm a Latina that is fair skinned, I have long hair, I'm wearing a, a kind of open blue shirt that's kind of wavy and black pants and black knee-high boots. <laughs> Hi folks, as Alejandro said, I am indeed Risa Shoup. I am very, very, oh, there we go, hey. Um, one more time for the seats in the back, literally. Thank you, Alejandra, thank you all for being here. And again, yes, I am Risa Shoup. I am five foot seven on a good day, white. I'm wearing a gray button-down shirt, blue jeans, and brown suede shoes. Tonight, the conversation is about fiscally sponsored artists and how we might best advocate together for our, to inform cultural planning that is currently underway here by the city of New York. To start off, I'd just like to take a moment to offer us a framework for our evening. Tonight's going to consist of the following activities. Welcome marks, which welcome remarks, which we are in the middle of right now. A research presentation, which will be coming up very soon. A panel discussion with invited artists um, representing the interdisciplinary landscape of fiscally sponsored arts here in New York City, which will be co-facilitated by Alejandra and myself. And finally, the very best part will be um, us going upstairs to the third floor to get together in small groups and do a much deeper dive into the opportunities and challenges presented to fiscally sponsored artists and the folks who provide them with fiscal sponsorship here in New York City. We're really, really excited for this. It's an opportunity to hear a lot more from all of you about your experiences and come up with some additional recommendations and information that will hopefully align with the research you hear tonight, but also may not, and that's okay too. And we'll be providing you with dinner, uh, not just because we want you to stay, but because it's important um, for us to be happy and healthy together. So we are really looking forward to that small group portion at the end. Now some logistical information. Smile, you are on camera. We're taking pictures and we are recording the event for archival purposes. If you wish not to be photographed, um, just let one of our ushers know and they will be sure to connect with our photographer. Um, second, you can continue the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag at DanceNYC, uh, excuse me, the handle at DanceNYC, hashtag fiscally sponsored artists, town hall, and create NYC. Third, to learn more about tonight's event, we also have the program that you see in your hands and all that information available on the web. And you're welcome to use um, your devices to check it out. The site is www.dance.nyc backslash events backslash fiscally sponsored artist. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Janet Wong, Associate Artistic Director for New York Live Arts. Well, hi everybody, I'm Janet Wong, as you heard. Uh, I'm the Associate Artistic Director of New York Live Arts and I gather I have to describe myself. Uh, I'm five foot nine and a half, Chinese woman wearing dark flowing clothes. That's about it. Um, okay, well, I'd like to welcome you all to our space, first of all. New York Live Arts is a proud member of uh, the coalition of fiscal sponsors um, that have joined forces with Dance NYC to uh, start this conversation about the landscape and future of fiscally sponsored arts. And uh, tonight, as you know, we are going to share the results of this and among other things. And um, fiscal sponsorship has been part of our uh, programs at New York Live Arts since we began. And we are very proud to have been able to continue to help um, artists, uh, body-based performance and educational projects uh, raise revenues and uh, benefit from uh, consultations on fundraising and uh, grant writing, so on and so forth. 
And um, some of you may be new to New York Live Arts, and some of you have been here before and familiar with what we do. I hope you come back to see some upcoming shows, like next week we have Larissa Veles Jackson's and Yakez world premiere of Give It To You Stage. Um, and after that would be uh, Adrian Truscott's There's Also a World Premiere, and then later in April uh, we will have the New York premiere of um, Okui Opakwasili, I always trip on her name, um, Poor People's TV Room, and also in April is a studio in process showing of Dance Noise New Work. So um, please come back. And now I would like to introduce uh, the Executive Director of Dance NYC, Lane Harwell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Janet, and thank you to the whole team here at New York Live Arts for hosting. Uh, and thank you all for being with us tonight on this cold Sunday. Uh, I'm Lane Hurwell, Executive Director of Dance NYC. And on behalf of Dance NYC and a coalition of nine fiscal sponsor partners, I'm delighted to welcome you to this town hall about the future of fiscally sponsored artists and arts projects. The whole evening is conceived as a major contribution to ongoing cultural planning by the city of New York and also as a game changer in advocacy for those making art outside of traditional nonprofit institutions. The research that we will share uh, is arts wide. It builds on Dance NYC's discipline specific studies and it also complements a recent workforce demographic study by Ithaca SNR on the Department of Cultural Affairs grantees, roughly 1,000 nonprofit institutions. Our goal is to shift the city's purview beyond institutions and to reveal the characteristics, needs, and opportunities of the sponsored arts. And in doing so, we hope to help uh, realize a cultural plan that is expansive, that is equitable, and that yields government innovation that directly impacts artists and their artistry. Now, this effort uh, has been one of collaboration at every level, and I have many people to thank. So first, the project's lead funder, the New York Community Trust, in particular, Program Director Carrie McCarthy for her leadership. We have with us representing the trust, Michelle Kumi bear Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Also, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, the New York State Council on the Arts, hi Deborah Lim, and the National Endowment for the Arts. While focused on the city tonight, we all must continue to focus on public support uh, at every level of government, and we must rally together to save the NEA. I also want to thank our researchers, Carrie Blake, uh, Christina Cruz, her team at Web Management Services, our partner, Ian David Moss at Fractured Atlas, uh, and the Dance NYC staff and volunteers working on the ground, in particular, Alejandro Ducas Fuentes, who is one of your co-facilitators this evening, and Jay Soto. Uh, also, our program partners, there are nine, Brooklyn Arts Council, City Lore, Center for Traditional Music and Dance, The Field, Fractured Atlas, New York uh, Foundation for the Arts, New York Live Arts, GOH Productions, and Pentacle. I think I got everyone there. Thank you, thank you all, and thank you to the artists who've lent their voices to our survey research and are here with us tonight. Finally, uh, for their critical collaboration, I thank the City of New York, Department of Cultural Affairs, and its cultural planning team, Create NYC, particularly Risa Shoup, your other co-facilitator this evening. Uh, and now I'd like to make a, a quick introduction to uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs, Edwin Torres, uh, who, uh, and to thank him for his, for his leadership. Um, uh, in so many ways, and to invite him to say just a few words of welcome. Please join me in welcoming Edwin. Um, I'm going to 
keep this brief. Um, whenever I've been in an event and somebody who works for the government grabs hold of a microphone, I can usually think of a number of things I'd rather be doing. So um, I just wanted to say thank you for making this time. Um, I'm really grateful that Lane brought you all together in this way. Because, you know, our having gone through this process, you know, we're still in process, but one of the things that's really sort of impressed itself upon us is that we've been doing this towards the development of a cultural plan that will release, you know, at the start of July, but ultimately what it comes down to is as long as we are working for the city, we remain public servants and are engaging the public towards this end has revealed to us the extent to which we learn from you. And that's the way it's supposed to be. The fact that we're doing this now towards this end has revealed to us that we just need to do this, period. That this is a really great opportunity for us, no matter what we're doing, to hear from the people who most support this city's creative life, without whom this city's creative life would not exist or be possible. And so, you know, while I'm very excited to have this conversation, I'm really excited to continue to have these conversations as long as we're working for you. So I wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Edwin. And now, it gives me great pleasure to finally introduce Carrie Blake of Web Management Services Incorporated, lead researcher and consultant on this project. Carrie will be presenting the preliminary findings and recommendations from survey-based research extended to nearly 3,000 fiscally sponsored artists and arts projects in New York City. Welcome, Carrie. go. First, a brief review of the research effort. Dance NYC, as you know, engaged nine fiscal sponsor partners who were critical to the effort. They provided background data on nearly 3,000 fiscally sponsored artists and projects. They helped us develop a survey. They helped us distribute the survey. They provided feedback on the results of the survey and helped us uh, understand the outcomes a bit better. Uh, they helped us get the word out about this event to their artists, and they did so in order to ensure that fiscally sponsored artists and projects are represented in the cultural plan. There was also additional outreach on the part of our team to maximize reach and participation. In addition to emailing the survey, we called all of the artists for which we had contact information. Thank you to those of you who took our call. <laughs> Um, and it is important to note that all of the artists that received the survey were invited to send it on. So ultimately, we collected 519 complete survey responses, which represent 485 projects. Uh, this research is organized into three parts. Uh, the first is the landscape of fiscally sponsored artists and projects and the survey sample, then the demographics of the fiscally sponsored arts workforce, and finally, the needs, barriers, and funding situation facing the workforce. So that last section really speaks to most directly to the cultural plan and will undoubtedly be the focus of our discussion uh, later on tonight. As we consider the survey results, it's helpful to have some context on the landscape. Uh, we worked hard to estimate the size of the fiscal sponsorship arts market using a combination of real numbers and informed estimates. The survey yielded an 18% response rate for our research partners, and our additional research suggests that there are a minimum of 461 additional projects that are sponsored by at least seven organizations that didn't participate in the project. So those figures allow us to estimate that survey respondents represent about 16% of the community of fiscally sponsored projects. But what about in terms of artists and the workforce? So we don't know the true size of the workforce because most fiscal sponsors do not collect data on the number of workers involved in each project, but we can make some assumptions. We had 519 artists responding to the survey and those artists worked on 485 projects. So an average of 1.07 artists worked on each project. So that allows us to conservatively estimate that there's a minimum workforce of 3,348. 
In terms of budgets, these projects are quite lean, uh, with an average budget size of just under $23,000. Uh, the sample of survey respondents is representative of partner data in all creative disciplines except for two. Uh, the survey received higher proportion of dance respondents and a lower proportion of film, video, and media respondents than was represented in data from our fiscal sponsor partners. Some of that variance may be due to the other unclassified category that you see there on the right. Uh, our partner, some of our partners maintain that category. It uh, represents interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary artists that aren't classified into one of these primary disciplines. The survey also asked about secondary disciplines. 86% of survey respondents are working in multiple disciplines and the average number of disciplines per artist is 2.73. The survey respondent pool is very representative of the partner data in terms of location. The data show very little variance by borough. This image maps both survey respondents and partner data. The colorful lines show the concentration of survey respondents, with red indicating higher concentrations in Lower Manhattan, the Upper West Side, and Central Brooklyn. And the purple shading shows the data on our partner projects, which is distributed more widely uh, throughout the city, but concentrated in similar areas, as well as in Western Queens. Survey respondents identify as artists. Uh, nearly half do not get paid for their work on projects, and this is generally true across disciplines. Also, we should note that for the respondents that do get paid, we don't know how much they are paid. The survey results also suggested some interesting things about the characteristics of the fiscally sponsored arts workforce. The workforce is quite homogenous in terms of race and ethnicity. Uh, this chart compares survey results on the left to the recently re released report on the Department of Cultural Affairs workforce, which we refer to as the DCLA workforce, to the city population according to recent census data. This suggests that the fiscally sponsored workforce is less diverse than the DCLA workforce and significantly less diverse than the city. For example, 74% of survey respondents are white, not Hispanic, as compared to 33% of New York City residents. The DCLA workforce employs higher pr proportions of black, African American, Hispanic, Latino, and Asian workers. However, it's important to note here that we did undertake two additional pieces of analysis to try to get a sense of the degree of representation of survey respondents to the actual workforce of fiscally sponsored artists and arts projects. And uh, while it's not perfect information, the results of those efforts do suggest that our response is not totally representative. Uh, for example, our additional analyses show that the people who took the survey were more likely to be white and were more likely to be female. So the survey is likely downplaying the amount of diversity that is present within the workforce. Uh, in fact, the white non-Hispanic segment of the workforce may actually be 6% below what the survey suggests. So that's an important caveat uh, to think about as we look at this data. The fiscally sponsored workforce is more diverse in terms of disability. 13% of the workforce is disabled as compared to 10% of the New York City population. The workforce includes fewer millennials and artists at the younger end of the age spectrum. 35% of survey respondents were born between 1980 and 1999, whereas 47% of the DCLA workforce were born between 1980 and 1999. The survey data also suggests that the fiscally sponsored arts workforce includes more females than the DCLA workforce as a whole. 65% of survey respondents identify as female as compared to 53% at DCLA and 52% for the city. However, as I noted with race and ethnicity, our additional analysis suggests that there's likely some survey bias present here as well, and that the proportion of females that are working within the workforce uh, is actually, could be 7% lower. So if we're, we were to correct for the survey bias, the difference in female representation between the fiscally sponsored arts workforce and the DCLA workforce would not be as significant. The fiscally sponsored arts workforce includes LGBTQ community members. A recent Gallup research study suggested that 4% of the city's population 
identifies as LGBTQ, whereas 27% of survey respondents do. And here are a few other interesting findings from this piece of analysis. Uh, LGBTQ respondents generally work across disciplines, though slightly higher proportions exist in dance, literary arts, and music. More Gen Xers work in the visual arts and in film, media, video. More millennials work in dance. Younger respondents are more likely to reside in Brooklyn or Queens. Literary artists are more likely to identify as non-binary. Nearly all disabled artists are white, and most African, Latina, Asian, Arab, and Native American artists, which we refer to in this project as Alana artists, reside in Manhattan. Uh, the results of a series of questions developed in collaboration with Create NYC, uh, with the team there, address challenges oppor and opportunities facing the fiscally sponsored arts workforce. First, the workforce needs assessment. Survey respondents were asked to rank seven needs on a scale of one to five, with one being not needed and five being very needed. And the results suggest that living wages are the most critical need for the workforce, followed by affordable space, affordable, affordable presentation space, affordable development space, uh, supplies, equipment, healthcare, living space, and finally training. These rankings are generally consistent when we look at the data across identity categories. However, they do suggest that living wages are paramount for respondents working in all disciplines except those from the literary arts for whom all other needs rank higher. For dance respondents, living wages and affordable development space are tied. Uh, in, ter in terms of borough, the need for living wages is paramount for respondents in all boroughs except for Queens where affordable presentation space ranks higher, and the Bronx, where respondents ranked living wages and affordable presentation space as both needed, they tied. Uh, the vast majority of the workforce is unable to both identify and access resources to fulfill their needs. Only 8% of the workforce has been able to identify uh, and fulfill their needs, identify, fulfill their needs. Examining these responses by discipline, borough, and additional identity categories uh, help us to better, I, better understand the barriers to access at a more granular level. For example, more of those working in the visual arts are challenged to identify and access resources, and more of those working in Queens are challenged to identify and access resources. More respondents who identify as disabled have difficulty identifying and accessing resources. Far fewer men report challenges. Than, than women, and more millennials struggle to identify and access resources than other age categories. This might be one reason why the representation in the workforce is lower. 271 artists are just uh, over half of the number of artists that rank those seven needs that uh, were, were displayed a few slides ago, offered recommendations on how the needs of the workforce might be satisfied. The top five most mentioned recommendations concern affordable development space, access to funding sources, affordable presentation space, affordable living space, and affordable health care. This ranking of priorities generally holds consistent when we look at the responses across borough and identity categories. Uh, it's also, it was interesting to read all of the responses to this question. So it's important to note that the repeated phrases within responses here indicate that there is great importance placed on mentorship and training for the sponsored arts workforce, as well as opportunities for greater centralization of communications and other services, such as fundraising, uh, administration, and otherwise. Values and barriers of fiscal sponsorship. Fiscally sponsored artists primarily choose to work with a fiscal sponsor in order to access funding, charitable donations. Other reasons include support and access to resources, that, uh, that they weren't ready to become a formal 501c3, and that they were drawn to the credibility and increased visibility that fiscal sponsors can provide to them. Uh, these rankings are generally the same across disciplines, boroughs, and identity categories, although Brooklyn and Queens artists ranked not ready for 501c3 a bit higher, uh, as did literary arts, music, and theater arts. Nearly one-third of the workforce experiences barriers with regard to fiscal sponsorship. 
Gender, race, ethnicity, and disability don't seem to be indicators of barriers for respondents. Uh, older artists from the baby boomer and silent greater generations indicate that they are less likely to experience barriers. And fewer LGBTQ artists experience barriers than artists who do not identify as LGBTQ. While access to funding is the primary reason for working with a fiscal sponsor, funding limitations are the most noted barrier. Uh, others feel limited by their fiscal sponsor's policies or because the public is not aware of or understanding of the concept of fiscal sponsorship. Uh, segmentation data suggests these barriers exist across creative discipline, borough, and identity categories. So does the workforce have ideas about how to address these barriers? Of course. 31 of 88 artists providing recommendations to address barriers suggested improved access to funding sources, and they were uh, principally addressing eligibility and specifically government and foundation funding. This, this finding generally holds true for all the creative disciplines, boroughs, and identity categories, although we should note that a significant portion of those 31 artists uh, come from fiscally sponsored dance makers. Uh, additional recommendations also emerged from this area of the survey, such as amending fiscal sponsor policies and services that better respond to artists' needs. Uh, sp this specifically, there was uh, quite a few mentioned to financial policies. And establishing resources for fiscally sponsored artists to support their ability to develop and deliver their work. So for example, training and communications on alternative business models for artists and expanded and improved fundraising services. Specifically, a number of artists uh, noted a need or request to better connect with specific donors. To dig further into the funding questions, survey respondents were asked to identify sources they've received funding from, from their project, for their project. While 94% of artists receive donations from individual donors, just 29% receive funding from government sources. These charts uh, summarize the segmentation findings, uh, and they show that just 15% of film, video, media, and 18% of literary artists receive government funding, as compared to 29% of all responding artists. And this also shows a high level of support for non-Manhattan geographies especially the Bronx and Queens. Uh, further segmentation analysis into the identity categories shows that lower proportions of Alana, disabled, and female artists access government funding. And in terms of funding needs, artists were asked if they were currently lacking funding for key expense categories. The results suggest that key funding gaps concern artistic and operational costs that support living wages with 88% of artists indicating need for salaries and artist fees and 86% for operational costs, including salaries. So this reinforces the earlier survey results that suggest that living wages are paramount. So what does all of this data and input suggest about the future of fiscally sponsored artists and how they should be addressed within the cultural plan? Together with our team of nine fiscal sponsors, we reviewed the results of the survey and, and discuss their implications. We prioritize issues and potential outcomes, and this is what we came up with. The first priority for the fiscally sponsored arts workforce concerns funding. Funding for fiscally sponsored artists and projects must be strengthened. In order to do so, our team suggests increasing city funding for decentralized granting programs to the fiscal sponsorship community through borough arts councils and other entities, also, we feel that these programs need to be reassessed and refreshed in order to align with the needs and realities of fiscally sponsored artists. New funding programs should be developed with existing or new partners that provide multi-year and general operating support. Opportunities for the DCLA to provide direct financial support to fiscally sponsored artists and projects should be explored. And we must ensure that fiscal sponsors and fiscally sponsored artists and projects are involved in city funding initiatives from their very development. The second priority addresses the need to connect fiscally sponsored artists and arts projects to the sources they critically need. This work recommends creating access to affordable presentation space 
And that could be by increasing access to existing spaces and protecting ex existing spaces, but also developing new space. Creating access to affordable development space, again, via a combination of new and existing space, and also supporting the fiscally sponsored arts community and identifying and accessing resources that help them develop and deliver their work more effectively. That might be through stronger communications and collaborative environments, and it may also be through additional technical assistance. And our final priority is to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in the sponsored arts workforce. This work recommends working toward that goal by including fiscally sponsored artists and arts projects in current and ongoing diversity initiatives and relevant efforts and programs, and also developing targeted initiatives to reverse the exclusion of Alana populations, amplifying the voices of disabled fiscally sponsored artists, and creating opportunities to engage both millennial and aging populations, which are underrepresented in the arts workforce. And finally, we need to build the capacity of fiscal sponsors to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in their networks. These efforts could serve individual sponsors, but they could also serve the collective group of sponsors via training, technical assistance, and financial resources. And I'm handing it, thank you. Back over to Risa and Alejandra. All right, everyone. So now we're going to move into the part of the program where we're going to start our panel discussion. So we're just going to do a minor set change and invite our fiscally sponsored artists to join us on the stage. Alright everyone, so I'm just going to do some brief introductions, a little bit of a roll call, um, just so folks in the audience know who's who, and then um, Risa will take us away with the conversation. So here with us, um, and I'm, I'm going to go from your left to right, um, so we have Carrie Bean who's joining us, we have Flash Rosenberg, we have Mark Travis Rivera. We have Jeremy, uh, excuse me, Jennifer Wenma. We have Rusty Zimmerman. We have Ramon Ponce and Jeremy McQueen. Um, hi again. Uh, I want to thank all of you guys for being here this evening and speaking with us. And I want to thank everyone in the audience for listening and Dance NYC and various partners for this event for helping to make this happen. I'm really excited to dive into this discussion, so that's what we'll do now. Um, I also want to make a note and say that um, in my discussions with Dance NYC, you know, I've learned that they intentionally asked a, a much more diverse group of artists to sit on this panel this evening than are reflected in the respondents of the survey. And I want to call that out and, and say that I really appreciate that. And again, that I appreciate all of what you all are going to share with us this evening and your work thus far in the field. Um, I think it's great to hear from people in their own words. So. Uh, for convenience sake, Carrie, if we can begin with you and then go to your left and have each of you um, briefly tell us who you are, um, maybe a little bit about your fiscally sponsored project and um, why, why you wanted to speak here on this panel this evening. I'm fiscally sponsored by Go Productions, which is a not-for-profit. Go, G-O-H, actually is a Japanese character, meaning working together under one umbrella. And Go have combined art services management and consultation for dance, theatre, music, media and cultural arts. And they've been established since the early 70s. And they also have uh, quite a selection of fiscally sponsored groups and it's interesting to note that some of the uh, projects that they fiscally sponsor are actually 10 times the size of Go. So Go's a phenomenal um, uh, not-for-profit that I really respect. 
I came to America 16 years ago and have been sponsored with Go for the last 12 years. I am a multimedia artist, musician, performance and painter, yes, all of those. And prior to that, I was a news and documentary video editor for German television during the era before the wall fell and shortly thereafter. During that time, I ended up painting my reflections on working in a newsroom during a time when there was a lot of political turmoil and war. And I would project these on venues in Berlin and then write songs and perform about the characters, either in my paintings or the situations that I incurred in the news editing suites. And from this, I came over to America and I created electronic music, worked on various productions with Go Productions. We have worked on uh, public festivals together. We've worked in theatre, marionette theatre, musical. I've made several art films. And for me, it's not possible without fiscal sponsorship. It is not possible without the support of a company that actually care about you as an individual and care about you as an artist and respect your work and want your work to spread and help other people. And just to end that, my current show is about immigration and people that have been displaced and it's on at Culture Hub on May 4th. Please come, thank you. Hi, I'm Flash Rosenberg and I'm an attention span for hire, which means that I do drawing, photography, writing and performing because they all are part of expressing yourself. They use all these skills to do animation and uh, primarily I support myself doing live drawing, which means while people are talking, I capture what they're saying and try to make it into images to accelerate understanding. And this uh, kind of use of art began, I've, I've always been interested in how art was a language to communicate, not something to decorate. And I began as an uh, artist in residence at the New York Public Library where I was drawing conversations between authors, because you'd think, why would they need an artist at a library? You know, and so I'm trying to figure out how we can make the arts be more public and more connected with people, which is why I wanted to be in this forum and talk to you tonight to say, how can we help artists be more necessary to people who might only think of it as something over there that's done selfishly to just express yourself, when in fact it can connect us. Um, I'm sponsored by Unique Projects, Inc., as well as Fractured Atlas. And what I like, and I think it's important to understand, is that these fiscal sponsors are not in competition. We're all in cooperation to try to support what it is we can bring to the society to create, uh, to, 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 to make life more meaningful and more playful and more fun. And I was especially interested in coming here because I want to try to find what's humorous about fiscal fitness. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in and say that. Um, it's so wonderful to hear about everyone's work and um, what is important to them in their relationship with their fiscal sponsor. We are on a clock. The clock for my friends on the panel here is right there. Uh, so if we can speed this up just a bit, that would help us just get, dive into the discussion more fully. It is not a reprimand at all. I wish we had more time, but we have what we have. With that being said, <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Mark Travis Rivera. I am the founder and artistic director of Marked Dance Project, a integrated dance company for disabled and non-disabled dancers. Uh, I'm fiscally sponsored by Fractured Atlas, and I am on this panel today because I represent multiple marginalized voices, and I wanted to make sure that disabled people, queer people, gender non-conforming people were represented in this fiscally, sp fiscally sponsored discussion about the arts and our role in creating for the city. My name is Jennifer Wanma, and I am a visual artist. I, uh, before physical sponsorship, I worked on uh, cross-disciplinary installations, and in 2012, I had this idea of making an opera. And um, it was, I had a, uh, an opera singer that I met that I wanted to write the opera for but I'm also musically illiterate, so, um, but I conceived the idea, I visually designed it, I worked with a lot of um, artists I collaborated with, we found a composer, um, we worked with librettists, and very fortunately, I did have um, wonderful commissioners, Lincoln Center Festival, Spoleto Festival, they came on board to um, commission the project. However, th it took so long, it was in 2012, I came up with the idea, and the world premiere was 2015. So it was a very long um, development period. 
and it was um, it just started with me inviting people to dinner and bribing them with food in order to work with me. So that was not very sustainable. Um, I started looking for funding, and I luckily found someone that was willing to sponsor, give us some money to for creative development. But they could not give to individual artists and said you have to get a physical sponsor. So that's kind of how I learned about physical sponsorship. I received a grant from NIFA a number of years ago. So I went to, so I felt like I had a relationship with them. I went to them, applied, received it, and then not only found uh, funding through this initial foundation, but other foundations and other ways. And that really greatly enriched our creative process. So even though with a project that was, you know, we're so fortunate to have had these wonderful commissioners, but without uh, physical sponsorship. And also what I found out was that it's not just giving money, but so much access to resources that I just wanted to, I guess I want to be here and talk about that aspect. That it's not just money, it's so much more. Hi everybody. I don't think I need this microphone. <laughs> All right, uh, in that case, uh, my name is Rusty Zimmerman. I'll try to keep everything uh, real quick by talking very fast. For the visually impaired, I look just like Brooklyn. I'm a bald-headed, bearded white man in a uh, shirt not unlike an Easter egg. I'm uh, also a heteronormative, cisgendered white male, which are new words I learned in the last few years. Let me know I'm here to fill out a quota. And um, I'm a portrait painter. I uh, took the last year or so to paint 200 portraits of uh, people in my neighborhood of Crown Heights, Brooklyn, and I uh, used the Brooklyn Arts Council as my fiscal sponsor to help make that large dream of uh, upheaving a tradition of uh, taking a dominant paradigm of portraiture being re reserved for a wealthy few and seeing what happens when you give it to everybody. And in the process, I set up a microphone, recorded everybody's oral history, and made an unintentional oral history of my neighborhood, uh, which is currently receiving grants to be turned into podcasts. The end. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ramon Ponce, and um, I'm founder and director of the Mariachi Academy of New York, which is a nonprofit that we started back 15 years ago to uh, preserve and keep alive the beautiful music and tradition of mariachi from uh, music from Mexico, uh, which uh, we do. We've been doing mariachi music um, for living here in New York for 26 years. My father and I started a band uh, called Mariachi Real de Mexico, and we've been lucky enough to, um, to bring our music and our tradition over to this city and to share it. And um, we are uh, fiscal sponsored by the Central for Tradition Music and Dance, which uh, is a great um, organization that helps a lot of programs. And uh, we are their first program, uh, educational program that they started because uh, they usually did just uh, presentations or concerts. But uh, we, came, we came to them with the idea of doing a, um, a school, an actual program where we could teach about music, about uh, what we do. And they were, they were kind enough to help us out and we got an, uh, an NEA grant, uh, the first one. And um, we've been, as I said, 15 years uh, keeping this tradition alive here in New York. And it's just uh, a pleasure for me personally to, to represent not only the Mexican uh, community, but, just, but also the Latin community in general. Um, and uh, I'm here to, to give a, a little feedback on what we do, but also uh, to let know that, uh, that the Latin community needs more information and sometimes it's not uh, accessible to us. And uh, it's, it's also my, 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 uh, a way for me to uh, to ask for help, you know, to the city and to, uh, and to make it available to everyone in, in New York City. So, uh, thank you. Good evening. My name is Jeremy McQueen. I'm the founder and artistic director of the Black Iris Project. Uh, the Black Iris Project is a ballet-based collaborative that brings black professional ballet dancers together along with black creative artists and very different uh, discipli disciplines throughout the arts to create new stories or new ballets that are rooted in black history and the black tradition. Um, we are fiscally sponsored here by New York Live Arts and uh, we just recently created a new ballet entitled Mediba which outlines the life of Nelson Mandela and that will be performed at the Kennedy Center in next, next month. Thank you all for sharing with us. Indeed. Indeed. Um, so let's jump in. Uh, 
Jennifer, I heard you talk about uh, the need for things beyond just fundraising. And I would love to actually know from all of you, especially with that figure we heard in the study in mind, right, that the average budget of the respondents was less than $2,300. I have no idea what you guys are working with in terms of budget. But with that in mind, given that that's what we all heard, and the, and the understanding that we all need physical resources with which to do our work, including space to both develop it and present it to the public. I would love to know from some of you how, your, how being fiscally sponsored has helped you access those critical physical resources, again, to develop and present your work or not. I'll share it. Fiscal sponsorship has helped me with fundraising um, in order to be able to kind of support the work that we do. Um, I've been able to have fiscal sponsorship to, to raise funds from individuals as well as um, from foundation grants, um, and those are all made tax deductible. It's, it's a lot harder to get individuals and especially grants to give um, money to you know, either for profits or for individual individuals, so it's been really helpful to have a sponsorship that um, allows us to make our, all of our donations tax deductible. lucky enough to receive a lot of help with getting access to spaces to rehearse and test out imagery and this has been very beneficial given the cost of trying to rent something. It's helpful because everybody wants to know what can we do. We are in a particularly helpless feeling time and to be able to tell anyone you can donate to the arts and help save this without having to just attend the show but also to be part of the support structure for it. And it helps everybody who's individuals, especially, who are donating, and that's mostly what I get funding from, um, feel like they have a place where they're you know, acknowledged and respected and productively doing something. Um, also, I was thinking about, uh, this relates to applying for grants, but um, Sometimes we're not really great at um, managing our financial situation. So I think there are these resources that help you, just looking at the budget sheet, actually applying for grants help me understand all the different aspects of creating a project. Because sometimes we just dive in without really thinking. I think that kind of planning, that financial planning, is actually really imperative to uh, run a sustainable project. And that's something that you got from working with your fiscal sponsor. I felt like maybe not direct, but indirectly, that process certainly did, yeah. Um, building on what Flash was saying, there's, there's something special about asking people for money and telling them to click on a link. And when it goes to a Brooklyn Arts Council page as opposed to send money to Rusty, it just looks so much more credible. <laughs> it gives you a sense of what I call manufactured credibility and it just makes you look more like a proper thing that people can feel confident making an automated monthly tax deductible donation through this portal, make it easier for people to give you the money. Um, and that's a great example of how a fiscal sponsor for you, it sounds like Rusty, for you, helped you access something that you really needed. And Ramon, I see you at the mic, and I hope you might talk to us about, you know, you, you mentioned in your introduction that part of what um, inspires you is the, the strong desire to share the work of mariachi yes. uh, with people. And if you could maybe talk about how your fiscal sponsor helps you do that, especially with regards to space. Yes, I, I think that one of the problems that um, an artist has is not having the knowledge or uh, sometimes the resources uh, to what uh, other organizations have. And uh, for us, uh, it was a great opportunity um, to learn about nonprofits um, via the Center for Tradition of Music and Dance because it is something that we don't do. I, I mean, every time I hold a mic is to sing and to play guitar and to do music. And uh, so it's, it's a totally new, new thing that you have to learn and it's always good to come up to someone who already knows or, or has the knowledge to, uh, to give you that advice and to help you. Yeah. I, I think I can likely speak for everybody. Um, I just have a feeling might have had a similar experience that uh, when, in my case, uh, I raised about $50,000 through crowdfunding to run my project last year, um, one of the first questions that fellow artists asked me is, how do you do that? And I think that's probably why we're all here today, to share this information and make it breathtakingly accessible to a mass audience. Just to get a multiplicity of viewpoints here, is that is that not anyone's experience? And 
Do you have other reasons for being here? I think part of being here for me, it's really about representation, nothing without us, as we would say in the disabled community. And I think part of the, as a young person, I was 17 years old when I started my company. We celebrate eight years this month. And when I started, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I was learning as I was going and making mistakes and stumbling and tripping on my own feet, literally. And then being physically sponsored gave me some legitimacy. It gave me some currency as a business person and say, I can be an artist and I can be a business person at the same time. Those two things don't need to be exclusive of each other. And so I think you know, part of the re reason why I'm here is really just to share that, that you can be an artist and be a business person and take control of your brand and use social media and technology to connect with your audiences and to really make sure that you generate these individual donors because we know the majority of our funding comes from individual donors and that's the power of storytelling. I would say also it just, it's different than writing grants. I find that such a waste of time that I can just go, I mean, I can shoot a bar mitzvah and make more money and get it that weekend instead of waiting six months to get a $3,000 grant from something that I probably won't get anyway. And so this sort of speeds up the process for having ongoing funding, which actually makes a difference. And so you're not just getting a little pat on the head of validity because you got a grant, but you're actually getting support. So I'm hearing a couple of things resonating. If we were to connect a lot of the points that everyone is bringing up to the recommendations that the research brought forth. So I'm hearing a lot of conversations about uh, business literacy and accessing the kind of tools and information that you need to be able to navigate yourselves both as artists and as folks that are managing budgets, right? Which is something that definitely came up in terms of the kinds of tools and recommendations that we would like for the DCLA to bring forth to either the different fiscal sponsors or first fiscally sponsored artists individually. I'm also hearing a lot about the access to space and to fundraising. I want us to move into now a conversation about equity and inclusion, right? Around our work, uh, around our practice, and also around how uh, the workforce can become more diverse and more inclusive and representative, like you said, Mark, um, in the work that we do and how these different fiscal sponsors and the DCLA can support that? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, is making room at the table. That's always the first step. Who's missing from the table? And how can we include them in the space? Making sure that your spaces are wheelchair accessible, um, making sure that you have sign language interpreters, making sure that uh, you take this business language and you turn it into layman's terms so that everyone can understand what's being said. You know, I come from a, Patterson, New Jersey, which is an inner city, the number, number three, I think, ranked in high crime and violence. And when I was growing up, no one told me how to be a leader, right? I came up to a broken education system, and I had to learn as I went. I think we need to develop young artists of color, young artists of color who are disabled, queer. Uh, we need to develop them as leaders. And how do we let them pass on the torch and say, the arts belong to the future, and you are the, the pioneers of that future. So how do we train them? I think fiscally sp sponsored programs need to take on that, that role of training these fiscally sponsored artists to do more and be more. I, I love this notion, and I wonder if we can spend at least a moment visioning together. Like, What would that leadership development um, in conjunction with a fiscal sponsor, what could that look like? And Jeremy, I'm looking at you because you haven't spoken yet, and we want to hear from you. Yeah, I think that that looks like mentorship and, and kind of advisement, someone that can really kind of hold your hand and help you understand, like some of other people had said this evening about like creating a budget and what that's like to really look at the financial landscape of how to make a project go from a dream to a reality. And so in terms of what, um, what else could be done, I think just making uh, more of an individual connection with your fiscal sponsors or with, with the organizations that you're sponsoring to find ways to uh, not just offer services, services, but being able to provide that individual connection to say, you know, this grant or this opportunity might be specific and really great for your organization or for what you're trying to do. I think that kind of mentorship, that one-on-one -on -one time is really helpful. And I see, one I see, I see your hand flash, I will get there. Um, and maybe this will also inspire you. There are a lot of disciplines represented here as well. And uh, this aspect of mentorship, I wonder how that could 
better be connected to discipline. There's also a lot of you, and I'm really impressed by this, who are moving between disciplines. I'm looking at Rusty, you know, we talked about painting, moving into podcasts. Um, Flash, you're doing animation, which combines lots of different disciplines. So yeah, mentorship with regard to discipline. What, what might that be like? I don't know if it's meant it's I think that we just need to have everybody be involved in the arts, not just even those who have fiscal sponsorship. I, this is my pet theory. I believe in a, there should be a National Artists in Residence Initiative, and that everything, every industry, every organization, every business, every household should have the three major things in life, which would be a toilet, a computer, and an artist in residence. And that you think about the pizza store that's down this block from you and you become the artist in residence. Get rid of these free internships and intersect in the community so that everybody's involved. You go to a grocery store, that's your place. You figure out how can I be the writer there? How can I do theater in this place? So that we stop isolating ourselves and saying, oh boo, we need money. Everybody needs money. You know, and we don't say, but everybody needs art too. So how do we intersect that and get small businesses to even sponsor us? And maybe those small businesses can do this through the fiscal sponsor to get a tax write-off so that we engage more people to be sponsoring the arts, not just people that think they're only interested in the arts. Um, in, in my experience, um, my, my work necessitated me to, to reach all 125,000 people in my neighborhood to let them know that the thing that I was about to provide would be available to them. And so in order to canvas the neighborhood appropriately, I had to, to reach out to people who had bigger voices than my own to make contact with um, my state senator and city council member and uh, assembly members and uh, district leaders and have them speak on my behalf and have them invite me to speak to town hall meetings and show up to community board meetings and show up to precinct community council meetings and find out what all these things were because the first time I did my work and I showed it to people I said what do you think and they're like what did the community board say I said what's a community board I didn't know um, I also think it's vastly important to meet people where they're at, to, to have meetings like this in Gravesend, to have meetings like this in Canarsie, in Flatbush, in East New York, uh, in the Bronx, um, and not trust that everybody can make it out to Manhattan on a weeknight. Uh, because, you know, when I had my exhibitions, uh, A, to make things radically accessible to a mass audience, I chose not to just put my work in galleries, but to put it in yoga studios and nonviolence. Uh, community centers and uh, laundromats and synagogues. And, and when I had parties, uh, receptions for the community, I found that the audience was predominantly 18 to 35 Caucasian folks in a neighborhood fabled for being Hasidic and uh, Caribbean. And I said, why is that? And people said, well, you know, the Hasids have a job and five kids and the Jamaicans have, uh, you know, uh, one kid and five jobs. and People are busy in their homes and they can't make it out all the time. And so you've got to set up shop where you want to reach your audience, go right to them. Uh, I had a similar, a slightly similar experience which has been incredibly positive and that is reaching out to a group that normally I, I wouldn't have done and there was a political huddle in my building. I live on 14th Street by the Con Ed power station and I attended it several times even though I'm not a citizen and can't vote. I feel very strongly about politically what's going on. And through this huddle, the ideas and the feedback that came back from the community who aren't artists but are placed in various strategic positions or associations throughout New York, they, they are so encouraging. And they're like, oh my God, we'll get you hooked up with this coalition and that person can sponsor the next thing as long as this is helping that charity and this and that. And you'd just be surprised, really, artists in general, if you just like reach a little further than what you used to, explain what you're doing. There are a bevy of people out there that actually do care. That's okay, you're fine. <laughs> um, Alejandra, I just want to check in and see, should, can we go a bit longer or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, great. Um, okay, so <laughs> we're having this great conversation about um, moving into community as artists and how to meet with the folks who we want to participate in the work that we're doing. That's what I'm hearing. Um, does, can anyone talk about how um, that desire to reach a certain group of collaborators, a certain group of audience members, and to perhaps um, go deeper within your local communities, wherever they might be and whoever they might be, how that was or was not facilitated um, through your relationship with your fiscal sponsor? 
I can share. Um, it was a lot of self-personal digging deep. Um, I, you know, I, I'm proudly with New York Live Arts, but at the same time, there are some gaps where I feel like I, I've been underserved. Um, I'm also a recipient of uh, Pinnacle has a program called ART, and I'm a, a, a fellow with them, which provides me with a mentor, provides, provides me with an administrative assistant that works about 10 hours a week for me. And I've really, I've only been working on that program for maybe about three months now, but through that, through that mentorship program, it's been really valuable. Um, it's helped open my eyes in so many different ways and has kind of allowed me to kind of free up some of my, uh, my administrative brain space so that I can focus more on the arts and how I can make an impact in my communities. Um, in terms of navigating specifically the black community and, and how I can make an impact there, um, I, it's literally just been me digging deep. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure of the demographics of how many um, fiscally sponsored artists that are of color or that are black within New York Live Arts. Um, but for me, it's really just been kind of having to reach out to schools and communities and neighborhoods that I know of and just kind of pulling the field and just saying, what would be beneficial for you? Would it be a master class? Would it be a, a discussion? Would it be a visit with a, a dancer? Or what would really impact your school and how can we be a part of that collaboration? Yeah. And that's great, Jeremy. And I think it does start with our communities. But I, I also think, you know, Lisa from Fractured Atlas has been really great at just kind of coaching me and guiding me and getting me in the right direction of things. Because of her, we were able to do really well on Giving Tuesday and we were able to raise $500 in one day. And that was just like so unheard of. But part of, part of my work is also making sure that my leadership team looks like the community I'm serving. So we have people of color, we have disabled people in positions of leadership and they have an investment in the vision of the company. You know, it's not just a dance company, but it's a company that really tries to break barriers. And how do we make sure that disabled people have access to these things? And our fiscal sponsorship so far has been really supportive in that. Um, when we went to apply for our first grant, they put up with my nonsense. And I was just like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. This is really complicated. Can we try to do this? And they were really helpful. And they're always really helpful in that regard, you know, and just always answering our questions and things of that nature. So um, it really just start with making sure that our community looks like the people we're serving um, and that it's not just the one person show. I can't do everything and so I have to build a team of people who can help me succeed in my mission and my fiscal sponsor is part of the helping team. I think in the spirit of going into the community and hearing from the community, um, I think this is a perfect segue for us to move into the discussions that we want to have with all of you that are here tonight um, and to hear from you, to hear about what your recommendations are, what fiscal as artists or what recommendations as people that engage with fiscally uh, sponsored artists, uh, what you might have to say that can inform the cultural plan and then can begin to address some of the things that we mentioned here tonight. Um, so with that, I want to first say thank you to all of our fiscally sponsored artists that are up here. And if you can join me in thanking them. Thank you so much, guys. And now we're going to transition upstairs to the third floor studios um, where you have dinner waiting for you um, and water and refreshments and all the things you can need. Um, and then we're going to get in some small groups and together you'll be interacting with all of the artists and, and we'll dive deeper into these conversations so we can hear from you what you have to say. All right? So we'll see you upstairs, everyone. Thank you.